Hey, everybody. It's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Welcome to a Wednesday afternoon, at least on the East Coast. We're seeing the afternoon just now arriving. Uh, hope that you are all safe and well and want to welcome you to a conversation we're going to have with uh, a gentleman who probably doesn't need much introduction at this point. He's been with us quite a lot over the last too many months, Dr. Richard Wenzel, and he'll be along in just a quick minute. But while we're entering the room, I'm going to take the privilege of just uh, inviting you all to go ahead and jump into the chat function. That's gonna be down there at the bottom of your screen. You can use your finger, your cursor, whatever it is you use to manipulate your computer. Open that up if you would, and go ahead and let's say hello to everybody. Chances are, when you open that up, you're gonna have an opportunity to either talk to all panelists and attendees, or it'll just say everyone. Go ahead and do that, and if you would, just a couple things. This has been our practice. Give us your name, where you're coming in from, and then we're doing this thing called the two-word check-in. This is this idea that we've been borrowing from Professor Brene Brown. The two words to describe how you're doing right now, and it's okay to say if you're struggling a little bit. We know this week in particular seems to be going to 11. There's a lot going on. And Shireen, how are you, my friend? Uh, so go ahead and jump in there. We'll also put in some links along the way. Uh, and with that, my colleague, Tristan Mahabir is running the slide deck. He's gonna advance this in a quick minute. We also have, and we've made this our practice. We're hopefully gonna be able to continue this in perpetuity. And we hope to encourage y'all to do so as well. We've offered up some closed captioning. So our friend, Rebecca, if you see on your screen, there should be a little box on mine. It's down in the bottom right-hand corner. It says CC on it. And then believe that it says closed captioning. If you crack that open, Rebecca is taking a note. She's transcribing live uh, all the things that we're gonna be talking about over the course of this hour. So feel free to avail yourselves of that, whether you need it or maybe it's just helpful to you. So in any event, thank you to Rebecca for doing that. Uh, Rebecca to heart, my friend, ready for anything. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. And we all know Rebecca's down in Georgia. And so we're, we're looking with bated breath to see what happens down there. And obviously thinking about everybody who's struggling. Sandra in Brazil, tired of COVID. Yeah, I get it. Betsy, how are you? You're at the beach. Oh, Betsy, you're winning. Uh, Carol, how are you? Could be better in Dallas. I'm sorry, Carol. Yeah, I know. This is, this is hard. It's hard. I, I was reflecting a little bit earlier today. This is, I think, month seven for us. And I was talking to some friends at Network HQ, as you all probably know, we've been, well, I'm at home, right? So we've been home and our expectation is as we're building our budget for next year, probably not thinking about even going into the office before next July, which is nine months from now, right? So a long road still ahead of us. Um, and we can all be here for one another. So let's try to make a plan to do that. Lisa, lovely to see you up in New York. Y'all been through a lot and I know there's a lot more coming your way uh, in the near term. And Jessica and Monterey, I know y'all, I can't even imagine what it must be like to be living on the West Coast, particularly in California, with COVID and the fires and all the rest of the stress that's going on. Um, and Nora, how are you from Iowa? I know you guys have been through a lot too and Marla down in Charlottesville. All right, so you don't need to be listening to me yak at you. Keep in conversation with one another, if you would, through the chat. And with that, Mr. T, will you take us ahead? I'm gonna tell you all a couple quick things. If you're part of V+, this was sort of this extended, expanded edition of our, our online conference. Um, chances are, hope anyway, that by now you've gotten a little something in your mailbox, not your inbox, but your actual real world mailbox. And among the things that was in that box, if you're part of this V+, crew, is a leadership you may remember if you were with us down in Austin last year for ComNet 19, we handed out a physical coin uh, and encouraged you all to share it with colleagues to actually help to celebrate and lift up people who've been helpful to you along the way. An effort for us to, to recognize that leadership as an activity and not really a role, right? So we've sent a, a virtual version you're seeing in this GIF, but also physical versions to everyone participating in V+. The chances are, if you're looking at us on Twitter or some other social media channels of ours, you may see folks using the hashtag comms for good to recognize colleagues and friends across the network who've been helpful to them across the last all too many months. With that, Mr. T, will you take us forward? A couple more quick things. Sharice, how are you pushing through? It's a good way to be. Uh, tomorrow, Dr. Clarence B. Jones, who's a friend to all of us, uh, and you probably know him as the man who helped to write the dream speech with Dr. Martin Luther King. He was also the man who smuggled the letter from the Birmingham jail out of the Birmingham jail. And if you're a James Baldwin fan, he was, uh, was Mr. Baldwin's personal attorney. So Dr. Jones is gonna be with us just in advance of the election to offer some reflections on all that we've seen this year and what we can uh, see ahead and, and the power of our vote and why that's just so important and the legacy of the civil rights movement. So all of that uh, uh, ahead. And so Mr. T, if you will, go ahead and scroll to the next one. After that, uh, the following week, or I guess just after election day, if you can imagine that, Matt Kendall Taylor, our good friend from the Frameworks Institute, is going to join us. He's going to be in conversation uh, with Marissa Kaiser from uh, KC Family Programs out in Seattle. Marissa and Matt are going to be talking about systems change and specifically how do we talk about that in a way that's really useful and helpful. And maybe that includes not talking about systems so much. So tune in for that if you're part of B+. Uh, and uh, how are you doing, Deborah? 
struggling a bit this week down in St. Croix. I'm sorry. It's one of those things, right? You'd probably see it on a postcard. It looks like paradise. But for all of us, this is really hard. And this is what Dr. Wenzel, I think, is going to talk to us a little bit about where we are, where we might find ourselves, and just acknowledging that for all of us right now. And I'm sending you a virtual hug, Deborah. It's, it's hard. It's really hard. And I don't think anybody has any real bead on, on when this is going to be over and, and how we can endure this. But, but grateful that Dr. Wenzel is going to be with us to tell us a little bit about what he knows, particularly as right now it's become really much more difficult to get good uh, impartial science-based information from a doc, right? So with that, why don't I stop yakking at you. Dr. Wenzel, sir, thank you again. We're all so delighted that you're happy and healthy and well and hoping that uh, you have a little bit of wisdom to share with us and grateful for your time and, and insights. Thanks very much, Sean, and uh, and Tristan, who's behind the scenes uh, for his help. I uh, thank the people who are tuning in today. And I show this first slide in large part to remind you that I have my <laughs> email address. If later on you have a question that comes to mind or you want to debate something offline, that's there. And also to remind me to tell you that <clears throat> if I mention a drug or vaccine, I have no commercial interest, no uh, equity in any product uh, that's a medication or a product device that's used in medicine. So next slide, please. So very uh, recently you've seen uh, that a lot of changes are going on in Europe and the United States. Uh, the title of this slide is, uh, slide is Elements of Airborne Pandemic Control. And these are the basics. And now in Europe, they're in their second wave or peak, and we in the United States actually are third. And as you listen to the interventions that come from different countries in Europe or different states in the United States, think of these basics and you'll be able to put it in perspective. So first, if you imagine that uh, this block on the right-hand side, a community, the community can be actually a country, a state, a county, a school, a nursing home, um, and uh, one of the first things you would try to do, if possible, would be to prevent the outside continual virus introduction into the community, limit that uh, opportunity to spark a new wave. And you can do that by closing off access. And I say that can be to a country, a state, a county, a school, or a nursing home. You want to block the virus. Once it's inside, then there are a couple of approaches you can do. You want to reduce contact. And we know, first of all, some basics. If we socially distance, use masks continually, clean the indoor air, which we talk about hand washing, that's one general approach. Um, but if we get the cases down to a reasonable number, we can do something else. We can do contact tracing. And this would be rapid testing available with quick turnaround contact tracing, isolation of infected people, quarantine of the exposed. Uh, so you know that uh, countries that did it very early and very seriously, like New Zealand, uh, Australia, Iceland, and Singapore, and South Korea, uh, did all of these very quickly and they did well. But I'm really uh, asking you to listen to the interventions that are gonna be proposed from Europe and the United States. Next, next slide. So uh, this is entitled SARS-CoV-2 Asymmetrical Infection. And I want to highlight the role of the super spreader. I could have called this slide COVID goes to the White House <clears throat> because there have been now two super spreader events. But let me look at the bullets on the right hand side and you'll understand. It turns out from studies in Asia now, 10 to 20% of the infected people account for 80% of the secondary infection. These are the super spreaders. And by emphasis, 70% of people who are infected transmit to no one. Now, the super spreader uh, will explain what happened in New Zealand. Only 19%, or you could think 20, of 277 separate introductions led to more than one case, led to sign of a super spreader uh, phenomenon. And in Italy, it explains the fact that three contiguous regions in the north, the 25,000 of the total 36,000 deaths occurred in these very narrow area, shows you the role of super spreaders. 
Sweden tried to do some of the controls, but initially had no special protection for nursing home populations, but did something right. They imposed 50 person limit indoors. Uh, we probably could have lowered that number, but they did importantly close down super spreader locales such as bars much better than we did. So what I'm saying, there's an element of chance for explosive outbreaks. You could do everything wrong, but if you don't have a super spreader indoors, you won't get the outbreaks. On the other hand, you could drop your guard once and in the brace of a super spreader, which I'll show you, you can get in trouble. Case tracing, case follow-up requires not only to look at the recent contacts of somebody you know is coming down, but to ask, who was the first? Where did he come from? So it's really detailed and that's the way it should be approached. Next slide. So in the next slide, I'll, I'll emphasize again the asymmetry. And I'll look at this largest COVID-19 transmission study from India. And in this study, the authors looked at 575,000 people exposed to about 85,000 infected people. And look at the bullets on the left, what they learned. In that larger study, 8% of the infected people accounted for 60% of transmission, again, super spreader. And again, consistently with the Asian study, 70% had no transmissions. They looked at certain risk of transmission. 11%, if you were in close contact, meaning uh, under six feet or so, and no precautions, no mask, or 4.7% if you weren't close or you actually took some precautions, so half of that. Shown here is one of the trains and in view waiting to pick up the passengers. If you were a train or bus for more than six hours and within three rows, obviously it was super spreader, 80% of those people within three rows became infected. Children five to 17 contacting the same age cohorts, 18% of their contacts became infected. So if there's any question about children being efficient transmitters, the study just takes care of that and says they're very efficient. Next slide. Go ahead with the next. So again, to stay with some of the data in the United States on children with COVID-19, and look at the bullets on the left, people under age 20, and lumped as children, comprise about 500,000 at the time I made the slide, 10% of cases in the country. So they're getting infected, but a much lower rate. As in adults, the children are overrepresented in black and Latino populations. And a CDC small sample of the people hospitalized. So of the hospitalized, and very few got into the hospital, but 33% wound up in the ICU and 6% on vents, similar to uh, adults. What's different is a small proportion get hospitalized. There are 121 deaths in children. 30 were considered quite healthy with no underlying problem. 91 of the 121 had at least one comorbidity and 54 with two or more. In a sample, 38% of children who died were obese. Now I'll come back to obesity later on. And this multi-system inflammatory syndrome, there were 935 cases. And this is the Kawasaki-like syndrome that can cause a disease of the blood vessels of the heart, among other things. And there were 19 deaths. So low risk, uh, but still unfortunate. One of the key theories that investigators of children said that children have fewer ACE2 receptors on respiratory tract cells, therefore fewer viruses to uh, latch on and create disease or severe disease. On the right, it shows you cumulative changes from May 21st and three months to August 20th. And you see cases in the middle hospitalization and deaths and the green line shows the children. And in all the cases, they're above the average for all the total population in the United States. So the cases are rising disproportionately, the number of hospitalization and deaths as well, though they're certainly lower risk than adults. Next slide. 
So in terms of college, uh, this slide is COVID-19 goes to college. <clears throat> so far, about 178,000 cases in 1,400 colleges and at least 70 deaths. So people could say that's slow, but that's still for young people, relatively healthy, 70 deaths. 45 colleges had over 1,000 cases. Largest outbreaks, La Crosse, Wisconsin State College uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, Gainesville, Florida. Now, just to show you the impact of reopening colleges, they added that aspect, reopening added 3,000 new cases per day in the United States. And if you look at rates in the county that has a college, 1.7 new infections per 100,000 from opening colleges, but almost twice that, 2.4 new infections per day per 100,000 if the colleges were teaching in person. And in contrast, there were no such increases in the surrounding counties with no colleges. Colleges with frequent testing, and I think this is important, had fewer transmissions. So if you're arguing for one of the benefits of testing is this, Cornell College in Iowa had one case when they added this up among 875 students. Amherst, three cases. Colby did very well with very few cases. And what they did is test every student and faculty member and staff on arrival and twice weekly. So more testing, rapid turnaround, isolate the bubble for two weeks, and they're doing well. It cost the president of one of SUNY's colleges uh, his resignation after 700 student infections. And I'll point out that some colleges in Wisconsin, Ohio State, Georgia, Clemson, over 3,000 cases. Now, in general, college kids do well, but not always. That's I pointed out above in the data. And here's the picture of Chad Durrell, Appalachian State, who died of COVID-19 complication. As you can see, very healthy looking adult child, if you will, but still a young man uh, unnecessarily from this virus. Next slide. Now, one of the reasons that uh, maybe young people are, and even older people are dying, it turns out that COVID-19 can cause prolonged inflammation in the hearts of both young athletes and middle-aged adults. Two studies here. The top on the right, 26 college athletes had cardiac MRI, the very sophisticated imaging of their heart after infection. 12 had had mild infection, 14 no symptoms at all. And yet 15% had inflamed muscle of the heart when they did this. And 31% had evidence of prior muscle injury, despite their benign, if you will, uh, course. Heart injury in, a in 100 German patients recovering from COVID-19, the mean age was 49, so middle age. A third were hospitalized, 18% had no symptoms. And the MRI of their heart, the sophisticated imaging, 78%, 78% had abnormal heart finding, 60% had ongoing inflamed muscle. So we're looking for maybe reasons why some people are called these long haulers, have chronic symptoms for months and months. It's possible that some contribution from their inflamed hearts we still don't know the long-term outcomes. Next slide. So I'll just bring you up to date with some of the numbers. You've seen these kind of slides before. This is the cumulative confirmed cases of selected countries. And the y-axis, if you will, is in log fashion. And so uh, left to right or so many days after, I think, the first 100 cases to even the playing field. And what you see, what you'd like to see is very low rise and then flatten out, which means there are no new cases. And since it's a log scale, even any kind of inclination means that there are a lot of cases going on. Unfortunately, the United States is number one with total cases and not shown here, but number two, very close to Brazil is India. So US, India, Brazil, then Russia, Mexico, and Spain. If you look to the box on the right, the United States not only has the number one total, but we're seventh highest rate per capita. 
and we've had over 8.7 million cases. Now, if you want to know globally how we're doing it, this statistic on the left in the box is showed what's the interval in time to go from 10 million to an additional incremental 10 million cases. So if you look at the first zero to 10 million, globally, we saw that in 90 days. The next 10 million up to 20 was 44 days. The next day from 20 to 30 took only 38 days and 30 to 40 means only 32 days. So what we're seeing is you'd like to see the numbers go just the opposite. If we're controlling this, then it'll take a longer time to get the numbers high. If we're not controlling this globally, it'll take a shorter time as there are more cases out there for transmission. Next slide, please. So this is a slide very similar, but this is a confirmed cases, COVID-19 for various countries. Again, log scale going out to 250 days past a certain threshold, 100 cases. So again, US, again, Brazil and India and Mexico uh, lead the way. And early on, it looks like Australia and not shown here in New Zealand, Japan, China later on controlled a very flat line. If you look at the box on the right, you find fifth highest per capita death rate. And we now have over 226,000 actually, as of just a, a few hours ago. If you look to the left, the bullets, another study has looked at the fact that this year we've had 300,000 excess deaths. We can ascribe over 200,000, two thirds to COVID. And we're not sure what the rest are. It could be missed cases of COVID or it could be those people who have COVID but couldn't get care or refuse to go there or people who had underlying diseases that they needed help but stayed home. But if you look at uh, the age groups, over 5,700 deaths were in the 25 to 44 year olds. So the younger people, younger adults are not escaping this rise. And this uh, in the 25 to 44 year olds was up 27% compared to comparable time in the last two years versus 24% in the older, somewhat older 45 to 64. The excess deaths, vary by, uh, if you will, white, Latino, Blacks, and Asians. So the whites had an excess 12% mortality this year. Latinos up very high, 54%. Blacks, 33%. And it may surprise you, Asians increase in the number of excess deaths, 37%. But one good thing I can point out is the last part. The death rate, if you're hospitalized, patients hospitalized, fell from 26% to 8% since the pandemic began. And I credit really uh, the uh, rapid response, the people in the ICU who are knowing how to ventilate better and have these protocols that are down. And the one drug we know influences mortality, steroids, if you're severely ill, improving mortality in intubated patients by 30%. Next slide, please. So I want to show you this uh, painting, uh, 1776, uh, if you will, uh, portrayal of Edward Jenner inoculating James Phipps, the child, with material from a cowpox lesion. And this is probably the best success in terms of vaccination in the history of infectious diseases. You remember that the story was that women who were uh, taking care of the cows uh, would pick up cowpox, and it was noticed that they never got smallpox. And so Jenner and probably several people before, and even though he's the iconic figure of vaccination, began to inoculate material from cowpox and was shown to be highly effective. Now, remember, it wasn't that long ago, 20th century, smallpox killed globally 300 million people, 300 million. It's the only infection that's been totally uh, disappeared, controlled, uh, and uh, not seen a, a case officially said to be uh, absolutely eradicated in 1980. Next slide. So as we look forward to vaccinations for uh, COVID-19, I'm gonna show you two slides of the four vaccine platforms that various companies are working on. 
So the genetic vaccines are vaccines that deliver one or more of the coronavirus's genes that code for, that give the instruction for making the spike protein. And the body makes antibodies to the spike and therefore uh, will prevent attachment to the respiratory tract. And you can see you have RNA or DNA in a circular piece on the left. In contrast, the other option, uh, uh, number two, would be viral vector vaccines. These are vaccines that contain viruses, usually an adenovirus, which is engineered or programmed to carry coronavirus's genes that also code for important proteins like the spike protein. So some vaccines will go in uh, into the cells, they won't multiply. Others uh, will go in, carry the coronavirus proteins on their surface and the body makes antibodies to this foreign protein. Next slide. So the other two options are protein-based vaccines. And these are vaccines that contain the coronavirus protein, such as just the spike itself, but no genetic material. And the body then sees this and then makes antibodies. And on the right, you see either an inactivated vaccine, so a killed vaccine, which is what we've done with influenza for a number of years, or attenuated vaccine means it's gotten weakened and won't cause infection, severe infection, but a mild infection, but it does create antibodies to the, what's carried. So those are the four platforms. Next slide. So, I thought I would show you just an example of uh, a phase three trial. This for an AstraZeneca. And for no other reason, it's one of the earliest that was published uh, of their protocols, widely accessible now. Looking at the safety, efficacy, and immune response of a defective adenovirus expressing SARS spike protein. So again, these are studies, the phase three prospective, means we're going forward, we randomize. So there's just uh, only a chance that you'll be to one, either the vaccine group or the control group and no bias in assignment. Double blind, so both volunteers and the people evaluating them do not know which person that they're saying did well or for were part of the vaccine group or not. Many of these studies are one-to-one. -one. This one is two-to-one twice as many vaccine recipients, this will be 20,000, and placebo will be 10,000. So if you volunteered for the study, which was briefly paused, now going back again, um, then you have two out of three chance. And the statisticians say that they'll do an interim analysis after 75 events, meaning infections due to COVID in the control group or the total group in this case, occurring at least 15 days from the second of the two injections. And then finally, they expect 150 events for the primary endpoint, assuming an infection rate in the controls to be just under 1%, 1 in 0.8%. So then you say, well, what do you do with the 0.8%? Well, you compare it, the rate in the controls to, here's three options I'll show you on the right. The vaccine rate of 0.4, that would be half, meaning the efficacy or ability to prevent infection was 50%. If it's 0.8 in controls, but 0.2, the vaccine rate, again, that'd be 75% efficacy, fairly good vaccine, but you'd like to have at least 0.8 compared to 0.1, almost 90%, 87.5%. So that's the general approach that all of these companies are doing in looking at these trials. Next slide. So on the next slide, what I'll show you on the left-hand side is the, I wanted to just show you the vaccine platform, the four platforms, and the names of the companies. So the RNA or DNA gene vaccine, you've heard the names like Moderna, Pfizer that teamed up with the BioNTech company, NIH, so one of the Chinese. These all make the gene vaccine. And I wanna point out that most of these vaccines when they're shipped around have to be in the cold but the RNA and DNA vaccines have to be deep frozen, not just zero frozen, but a minus uh, 70, 80 degrees or so uh, centigrade. If you look at the viral vector, AstraZeneca, as you know, had that, uh, and you know that uh, Johnson & Johnson. 
uh, again, has the viral vector vaccine. Both paused briefly with uh, one person they were looking at with an untoward event, now ready to start again. No link to the vaccine could be seen. Subunit particle, Novavax, uh, we use that subunit and uh, that's a company just outside of DC. And the weakened viruses, uh, the whole viruses, uh, these are all from China. Next slide. Now I wanted to look at the issue of obesity and COVID-19 vaccines. Um, it, it turns out that 42% of the Americans are obese with a BMI greater than 30. That's not good because the obesity predicts increased mortality among those infected. And it turns out the third bullet immune response to COVID-19 is weaker in patients who are obese, which may explain the fact that the virus in obese people lingers five more days than people who are not. It is known that adipose tissue, fat tissue, harbors more ACE2 receptors and may be a kind of reservoir for the virus. And we know from earlier studies, years and decades ago even, the patients who are obese, they get a weaker response to influenza vaccine and hepatitis B vaccine. So here are the questions. Will response to the COVID-19 vaccines in obese people be weak or might it be inadequate uh, in obesity? And secondly, a linked question, can the clinical trials actually identify this issue? Should it turn out to be an important one? We'll, we'll hope that it will identify this and then we'll try to respond. Next slide. So I'd like to tell you that there are three things that have to happen to get to herd immunity. Uh, one is we have to have enough vaccine, which I'll come back to. People have to be willing to accept it. The vaccine has to be really good, efficacious. And we want to target 70% uh, herd immunity. Assume we have 10 already from natural infection. We need 60% more of population. So what I have is efficacy looking at 50% or 75% or 90% of people protected from the vaccine. And then imagine two possibilities, percent acceptable, 50 or 70% in each of those. And a recent Pew study suggested that only 50% of Americans would take the vaccine if offered today. So let's look at a 50% efficacy, half, and only half the population. So half of half would take it. That would give us 0.5 times 0.5. Proportion of the population protected would be 25% only. Waste. And if you look down and say, wow, what about 90% efficacious, prevented 90% of infection? But, and we were lucky enough to get 70% of the people to take it, if it was that good. That 0.9 times 0.7 gives 63%. That's what we need to get the herd immunity. We need a vaccine that is both 90% effective or more, and at least 70% of the population willing to take it. That's a little bit uphill for us now, but you need to know that. Next slide. So my last slide looks at maybe what it might look like in the next year. And the title is Vaccines, Herd Immunity, the Control of COVID-19. And the top, if you will, shows the vaccine doses. And I'm asking you to imagine that we have available 20 million doses, 200 million doses, or to the right, 400 million doses. And the seasons are in yellow. I have in fall of 2020, I don't expect that we'll have a lot of vaccine available. Uh, I'd love to be wrong and we might get lucky. But I think late December on the winter of 2021, we might have as many as 20 million vaccine doses. And maybe by spring, 200 million, and by summer, 400 million. So if we in the winter had 20 million uh, doses, that would be enough for 10 million people if we have required two doses per vaccine in the majority. But 10 million people is only 3% of our population. And who would be the target? Well, we would target very high risk people, the first response of people, 
the ICU uh, clinicians and respiratory therapists and nurses, and then people in nursing homes, uh, those with many uh, comorbid conditions. If in the spring of 2021, we had 200 million doses, that would be enough for 100 million people if we're using the two to one, two doses, enough for 33% of the population still short of herd immunity. And the vaccine target would now be expanded to people with maybe only one or two risk factors. And then if we had by summer, well, I'm pretty sure I'm optimistic that we'd have 400 million doses, at least 200 million people would be covered. That would get a 67% immune. And then we can begin to think about immunizing young, healthy people in the summer of 21. Now the acceptance level I have down there as well. Early adopters, I think, uh, will be an issue uh, maybe by winter. Not everybody, even who needs it, will probably adopt this early. By spring, I hope people are looking back and say, you know, it really looks safe. We've given it to several million people. And hopefully by next summer, much more acceptance of effective vaccine. And as a result, if you look at the bottom line, COVID-19 trajectory will be rising, in my opinion, in this, in this fall season through the winter and maybe slowing by spring for a number of reasons. Hopefully we'll have up to 200 million doses. We'll have people outdoors more than indoors uh, and uh, whatever else the weather might do to get us away from the dry uh, indoor air. And I'm hoping by the summer 2021, 20, we will be able to say, we've controlled this. I don't expect it to be eliminated, but we'll control it. Next slide, I think just uh, says, I wanna thank you very much. I would love to entertain any questions or comments or alternative uh, views. Thanks again, Sean and Tristan. Thank you, Dr. Wenzel, it's tremendously helpful. So I'm gonna take the privilege since I have a microphone to ask the first question as a parent, Halloween, Saturday, what do you do? What's your best recommendation? Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan uh, of telling the kids to go out because what you really wanna do is have at least six feet of distance. People can wear masks, but real masks, not just the Halloween type masks. Because what happens is people cluster around a house and they wait in line for the candy or the treat, whatever they're giving out. And I think that is a um, safer than indoors, although some, if it's cold weather, sometimes you're invited into our house. But for the most part, I assume it's outdoors, safer. But as you know, from many uh, sort of these gatherings, if you are shoulder to shoulder to people, not everybody has a mask or they're not wearing it properly. And you have a super spreader at that moment. So um, I would hope people would come up with an alternative this year, stay with their nuclear family or the bubble of their friends if they have also behaved as well as you have in terms of admiring. But it's more time for the family, I think, is the way to look at that. I'm very cautious, but that'd be my view. Gotcha, so those bags of candy we have downstairs hidden away apparently are gonna become sugar bombs for our little people. Um, Okay, questions coming in from our colleagues and, and gang. I'm looking in the Q&A box. So if you have a question, please put it in there. You can also vote for questions. So I'm gonna start with Lisa's questions because it's gotten the most votes up. Lisa Stein asks, what are the implications for returning back to an office environment? Based on everything you just told us, Dr. Wenzel, when might we reasonably expect or hope to be back in sort of a, a normal office environment? So offices are indoors. And so the first statistic to know that so far, in general, the crude rates indoors for COVID are 20 times greater than being outdoors. So it puts that in perspective, and that's a pretty big number. So a lot depends on what's going on in your office. I know a lot of companies have put a lot of work into making their usual hubbub where people get together and exchange ideas to be totally different from COVID. They have the plexiglass barriers. They're doing things to improve the air exchange. To me, it's the air exchange that is really the important one. So what do you do? If possible, open windows and doors. We want the outside. The second thing is if you're capable and you have the resources, the right size building, ask engineers to look at putting HEPA filters in because that will really remove viruses and perhaps have enough air exchanges by itself. The third thing you can do, and I see people beginning to do this in offices and even in physicians and dental offices, See if you can get somebody who knows 
how to do this, put in ultraviolet lights, which kill virus very quickly. Now, uh, people have been doing that in microbiology labs for decades. Uh, there are now machines, and I can't say I can point to any clinical trials, that you plug in. And some of them have up to, from one to four, even uh, more air exchanges per hour, but they have HEPA filters and they expose the air to UV light. In theory, that should work, but I can't tell you that I have any data, but I know people who are trying to do that if they can't put in the raw UV light itself. So the real question is, how close will you be to your colleagues? How clean is the air? Are you able to improve those? One of the things many companies have learned is they do pretty well with people at home. And I think the current targets are often January 1st with the idea option for expanding the at-home work. Well, and based on that Indian study, it's not just going into the office, it's getting there, right? The possibility of, you know, for all those of us at Network HQ, we all use public transportation. And so we've made a decision. It's not just about keeping ourselves safe, but also being mindful when you enter into those kinds of spaces, you have a possibility of hurting somebody else. Absolutely true. Okay, next question comes from our colleague, Teodora, who asks, in the current absence of pharmaceutical treatments and vaccines, what is the role of primary prevention to strengthen the immune system? And then following on, why aren't we talking about the role of nutrition, exercise, and alternative medicine and natural remedies as effective and cheap ways to build effective immune responses? Well, I like the question very much. Uh, if I were to tell people, look, you know all the things that work. We want masks, we want distance, uh, we want hand washing, certainly. But as I mentioned, one of the key risk factors is obesity. And we know that people are gaining weight during this period, particularly because they're not exercising enough, they're home more, they're snacking uh, more, uh, even more alcohol, perhaps. Um, what you don't want to do is become sedentary and you don't want to uh, uh, pick up uh, your BMI at all. So we tell people, try to do some exercise, get out if you can, walk uh, one mile, two miles, three miles or more. Uh, and uh, if you can, try to watch your diet and, and really stay with uh, the non-carbs if possible. Uh, watch your drinking. Um, don't smoke uh, if you were doing that. And I think these are the key things. And I would tell you again, get the flu shot. You don't want to be in a crowded office, a crowded emergency room, exchanging droplets with people who have both flu. There are going to be four times the types of flu floating around, not just one and COVID. So these are some of the general things I would say to people. And for what about folks I've noticed just in our own neighborhood, uh, lots of folks out exercising, wonderful and good, but a real shift in the number of folks wearing masks while they're out and about. Is that necessary? Is that, are people, I, I, that probably reflects a little bit of anxiety, I would think on people's parts, or is that just a good practice now? When you go outside, put on that mask, keep it on. Yeah, I don't think if you're, if you're not gonna be in crowds, you probably don't need your uh, uh, mask. And again, we know from uh, dynamic studies of droplets that if you're walking side by side to somebody and you're six feet away or so, uh, you're very uh, in good shape. If you're behind somebody and fewer than six feet, those droplets of that person can move back. So go on a diagonal or go parallel to the person you're either jogging with or walking with or riding a bike with. And the faster you're moving, the farther back you should be from the person up front. So I think given all that, um, most people don't need masks. Um, if somehow you're gonna go and jog somewhere and then get close to where there's a big crowd, uh, put it in your pocket, bring it out for any kind of gathering. Uh, but I don't think you need it in general. Got it, got it. Our next question comes from Abigail. And we have a lot of questions, so I hope you're able to indulge us with a little bit of time. Uh, Abigail asks, do we know why the rate of infection in children has grown so much? And, and parenthetically, she adds, I would assume it would be because of school attendance, but May through August is primarily summer vacation. Is it because people assumed for too long that children weren't at risk? Yeah, I don't know for sure the answer, but I think that it's a combination of all of the above. Uh, in the beginning, it was primarily older patients and it clustered primarily in nursing homes, uh, particularly in the New York area. Um, and the children were, if you will, cloistered away from that particular cohort 
of older pieces for the most part. Um, and then as the summer came along and we relaxed, and then a school came back, I think, to gathering. And we're recognizing, as I showed you the data, that it's a very efficiently transmitted from child to child. And remember, these are social uh, butterflies that really like to get together whenever they can. And I can't blame them. This has been rough on kids. Um, so I think it's all of the above so far uh, that have increased uh, the use of maybe even the, the non-use initially of masks for young children as well. And any advice for parents out there, given the fact that many children are now in Zoom school situations, looking for outlets, looking for socialization, is going and playing soccer or, or doing a backyard play date with masks safe and, and, and uh, something you would recommend? Well, I, again, what you want is distance and, uh, and uh, protection from droplets. So if you can work that out, uh, you know, the, some sports are fine for that. I wouldn't put football uh, in that, that group because, you know, you're, and we've already shown that that doesn't work a lot of times with the pro ball and the college football. Uh, but if you are a track star, and you like to run, to me, that would be ideal. Tennis probably be fine. Just don't meet at the net. Uh, and I think if you can do those sports that would keep distance, and then if you need the mask, then the mask uh, whenever you're up close. Uh, but I think you really have to be careful. And this is a problem, the long haul that we need. Our target for me is going to be late spring, early summer. Um, we're not used to this kind of marathon, but hang in there. You drop your guard, this virus can move in. Next question comes from our friend Thaler up in New York. She asks, how can we assure that any vaccine is effective with the elderly in particular? And, and Dr. Wenzel, are you familiar with the Harvard Medical School trial of the BCG vaccine to alleviate COVID infection in the elderly? And if so, can you comment on that particular trial at Harvard Medical School? Yeah, BCG is a vaccine that's used uh, to prevent tuberculosis. And uh, it's not used in this country because we have a lower rate than a lot of areas uh, like the India, for example, and some parts of Asia where they need this. And one of the things that's been found for some time uh, is that this vaccine actually boosts immunity in general. Uh, how much and will it prevent COVID? Uh, it's unclear, but the markers suggest that maybe this is going to be something we can do. Even some other vaccines have been shown to boost immunity through some mechanism that we don't fully understand. So it may be that we have other ways of doing that. My guess is that we'll have uh, better answers uh, by the late winter on vaccines for COVID than we will on the immune, general immune boost. But if you said, gee, the people are watching this carefully, uh, uh, looks like some boost in people who are getting this, um, it's hard to argue. You have to look at the side effects. Uh, for example, this BCG is sometimes used to treat bladder cancer because it does something else in addition to uh, just uh, protect you from uh, tuberculosis. However, it's a live virus. It's a live bacteria. A live bacteria. So if you're immune suppressed and you have this, sometimes this escapes throughout the body. And some of the patients who've had bladder cancer have had unfortunate side effects with that. So you want to do this under strike, strict protocol or strict uh, observation. Okay, next question comes from Maria and she asks, as folks working in communications, how can we promote the safety of vaccines to those who are, are vaccine skeptics, to, to the anti-vaxxers that we have out there? What can <clears throat> be helpful? Well, yeah, I, you know, there's a woman who works at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and I think her name is Heidi, I'm blanking on the last name, but she's the, an expert on rumors, uh, if you will, concerns the people who are, as she says, vaccine reluctant. And you know, you're tempted when you see these people say, look at all the logic here, look at the data. We're just trying to help you and your family. You're either ignorant or you're full of hubris or you're denying. And she said, that doesn't work. What you have to do is engage these people. What is it that concerns you? And then listen, really listen. <laughs> Excuse me. And she says, if you do that, 
you will begin to get inroads because some of the people have real concerns. They're skeptical of large institutions and that includes medicine and public health and industry. Industry is just out there to get your money, that kind of thing. We have to listen to them. We also have to respond um, in a different way maybe than we have in the past by just blasting them with data. That doesn't work. What we have to do is say, what we're trying to do, and I think one of your goals is to protect your family, your children, so they'll grow up um, and not uh, miss a birthday uh, somewhere along the line. And we have, I, I'm not saying get overly dramatic or emotional, but get to some of the key things that we all agree on. Um, and we both want our children to live happily. Uh, we have to approach that, uh, even though we're kind of on the vaccine side of the fence very much. And this is a different group. So listen and engage. Mark has a question. He says, once multiple vaccines are available, will there be a way for the public to evaluate which vaccine is most effective? How will we know, you know, Johnson & Johnson versus Moderna? Sorry if I'm messing these up, but, but how can we make a good decision for our families? That's going to be difficult. And what you have to do is look very uh, specifically at uh, the effectiveness Let's assume they're all 90%. That would be wonderful. Um, how many doses? You know, maybe only one dose, Johnson Johnson, maybe two with everything else. Does that help? Because then you wouldn't have, because people may not remember which vaccine they got. And they show up again for the second shot and say, well, which one did you get of the several? And then look at the uh, adverse effects. And then there may be subset analyses in some that are better. For example, it may be the one vaccine did better in obese patients. Another vaccine did better, better in patients over 65. And I'd be looking for these subsets that might give me some guidance. I'm gonna look first for safety and then efficacy, and then the profile of adverse effects and the profile of advantages. And that's the best we can do because I'm pretty sure that no one's gonna compare one vaccine to another, see uh, how we do with that. Hopefully they'd be equally efficacious, but these are some of the things you might look at. Next question comes from our friend Lisa up in Alaska, and she asks, and this is something I'm certainly curious about, what are the characteristics that make someone a super spreader? Is there, is there anything in particular you can sort of walk into a room and go, that person's probably a super spreader? Is there any indications or anything we know about what makes some person more likely to pass this virus on? Yeah, I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, if, if they all had uh, purple hair, it would be wonderful because then we could target that group. And you know what we would need for herd immunity would be that 10% plus which a little bit more. We, we may just get to uh, herd immunity that way, but we don't know who they are. My current thinking for the time being is they're able to disseminate of large droplets to a greater extent, maybe going beyond six feet, maybe going 15 feet, and maybe even aerosols more efficiently. So it stays in the air for two hours, three hours, whereas most people had a small number of aerosolization or uh, maybe they don't hang around as long. So I think it has something to do with droplets. That's my current thinking hypothesis only. Gotcha. Uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot real quick and then we'll get back to some of the other questions. You are an at-large editor at the New England Journal of Medicine and they recently came out with an op-ed. It was a first in their history. Any comments or thoughts on that? Uh, with regard to the election? Yeah, well, uh, in full uh, disclosure, um, I'm a co-author as uh, one of the editors in the New England Journal. Um, and what we as a group of editors did, breaking a couple hundred years of tradition, is to come out and say, look, we really didn't react to this. And what, one of the key points to take home lessons from COVID is you need more than science. You need leadership. And we did enormous scientific things to respond to COVID, but we didn't have the leadership to get this under control in the opinion of a number of us on the board of the New England Journal. And we thought that was an argument enough to say, uh, so many things went wrong uh, that we really put ourselves in harm's way unnecessarily. And that, uh, uh, you know, I'm usually don't talk politically, but we need a change 
in order to lead us out of this problem. Okay, getting back to some more questions from our friends. Uh, Rebecca Smith asks, what are your thoughts on a report that was out yesterday uh, that says antibodies seem to fall quickly after infection? In other words, you don't maintain an immunity for much long. How would that impact vaccines? Well, what it would do if it's confirmed, I know there have been studies sort of uh, uh, looked at it so far and said, well, we have pretty good robust immune response, both B cell and T cell, meaning antibodies plus the soldiers in our immune system for at least four months. There have been some of those that came out of uh, Iceland uh, and others it's, may think, well, that's what they mean by short term. What it would mean would be, uh, we'd like to know some details as much as possible, but it would mean that we might need booster uh, inoculations if that's so. We need to know the mechanism why, they're, uh, why the immunity is brief. Um, it has been the same thing with other sort of uh, coronavirus such as MERS or SARS. Um, and yet some studies go the other way and say, you know, people with SARS, more than 10 years later, have T cells, these fighting uh, immune response cells that can actually kill a virus inside a person's cell, lasting for 10 years. And so when they show up with a, a challenge, they're ready. Uh, so the data are mixed so far, but it would mean probably more boosters or a better type of uh, vaccine that we just don't know how to characterize yet. Next question comes from uh, our friend Susan who asks, are there any effective air filters that we could use in our home? So maybe we don't have that engineer who can come in and do building engineer type stuff uh, or something that we can pick up and bring into the office with us. Is there any particular kind? I know you'd mentioned HEPA filters. Is that all you need to look for? Is that HEPA symbol? No, there are people who are really into this and there's something called MERV, M-E-R-V. And what you want is a high number for that. And, and I'm not an expert in this kind of uh, filtration of various different filters, but uh, the people who do these HVAC things know something about that. So I would probably you know, talk to them or talk to people who sell these filters and say, is there any way to move up to a higher filtration rate, a MERV number? And for what it's worth, Susan, I know uh, we're big fans of the wire cutter at Network HQ. So Tristan, maybe you can toss in a link there. They've been doing some reviews of filters that you can buy up over the market. Uh, so hopefully that can be helpful to you. But MERV is, I think, the thing that we heard there that you want to listen to or you want to look for is higher MERV numbers. Uh, Phil asked a question. Most of the countries, and this is looking back into the presentation, on the chart of large metropolitan areas of 15 to 20 million people, um, are there cases concentrated in cities or are they spread throughout countries? So for instance, in the United States, we can look at a map now and see that it appears that the virus is now pretty much everywhere. It's not just centered in cities the way it was when it was maybe starting in Seattle and New York City and then moving on from there. Um, but elsewhere in the world, if you look at places like Brazil, like Spain, are we talking about mostly the virus sitting in places like Madrid or Barcelona, or are we talking about it now moving throughout those countries as well? Yeah, just to put it in context of my first slide, uh, this virus came airborne, truly airborne, in an airplane uh, from China, both to New York uh, before we recognize it and coming the other way to Seattle, LA, San Francisco. So they're the introductions. And then you're into a big metropolitan area. And before you know it, you have 10,000 infections is what happened in New York City. And New York, it also, came from Europe. So it went from China to Europe and then to the United States where it spread very well. So the introductions are usually in large metropolitan areas brought in by where the ship arrives or where the plane arrives. Then it hits that really dense population and the vulnerable. So uh, uh, a lot of both West Coast and East Coast was the nursing home. 40% of infections in fact began there. But this virus is an equal opportunity. And so then it started to spread south and we found out, well, for a lot of reasons, younger people were getting it, fortunately not dying at the same rate. What we have now as this virus has moved to uh, the north central part of the country and northwest, again, the, the mountain areas, the actual rates per capita rates in rural areas now exceed 
the per capita rates in the metropolitan areas. Um, so again, uh, any opening at all, this virus will try to hitch on a ride. And, and so actually, our friend Lisa, who's in Alaska, just wrote into the chat and, and said there is widespread virus in small, isolated Alaska villages off yeah. the road system right now, despite testings at their hub airport. So presumably people coming into Anchorage or elsewhere, they're getting tested and still it's finding a way. Yeah, we would say even in our own Navajo population out west where we saw this, once it got in, uh, vulnerable people, many of them are diabetic, some are obese. Uh, they're crowded conditions. They don't have as much access, but amazing job of case uh, tracing uh, that they did in those uh, Navajo villages. Okay, next question is to someone who comes in anonymous, but uh, has a little bit of reason to worry maybe. Uh, how far can droplets spread outside? And they say, my balcony, so they're in an apartment, is only a couple of inches from my neighbor's balcony with a small wooden fence. Um, we all are now spending a lot of time outside on our balconies. Should I be worried about droplets on the balcony? This past weekend, they had a, a Halloween party with maybe 25 people <clears throat> who traveled in for it, and it was inside. But, but do you recommend if you're if you have a balcony that's adjacent to somebody or you're living in a situation where you don't have a lot of private personal space that you avoid those spaces? Well, the only analogies initially would be uh, people who've looked at runners and joggers and bicyclists. And again, what I said, if you're behind somebody and you're walking, probably 10 feet is fine. If you're directly behind and you're jogging, you may want to move that out to 15. And if you're biking, you want to move out to 20, 25 feet. Because those droplets in studies where they've looked at droplets using lasers uh, say that can happen. We also know that large droplets can travel, you know, uh, beyond six feet, maybe occasionally up to 15 or 20 feet. Uh, droplet, uh, the aerosols just follow the wind current. So being outside is good. First of all, you're one twentieth risk of being indoors. And for a lot of reasons, one, you get the dilution of the air and the UV lights if you're uh, during the day with the sun out, both very effective. Now, if you're inches away from a neighbor and you're conversing or particularly if you're having a strong lemonade and loud voices and you get closer, uh, you pick up the odds a little bit. So mostly I would say it's relatively safe, uh, but I would try to keep in mind the basics, distance, mask if you get closer. Uh, Lauren asks a question for us. Have you heard any more data? We talked about this a little bit earlier uh, regarding pregnant women and the outcome of pregnancies and COVID-19. Uh, I haven't heard much more. I mean, pregnant people are at risk uh, compared to their age match uh, cohorts who are not pregnant who get infection. Um, so they're at risk of uh, winding up in ICU. Uh, I haven't seen data recently on uh, more data on the outcomes. Uh, I think in general, there was initially a thought that this doesn't cross the uh, uh, placental barrier. I don't know if that's been confirmed. So it's just something I would have to look up and I'm sorry, I don't have that right away. But I haven't heard a lot about a uh, huge risk to the baby. Uh, and sort of a related question. I know, for instance, my dentist miss me, misses me quite a bit. Is it safe now for most of us to go in for that well visit, to go in to see the dentist, whatever it may be? You feel comfortable recommending folks do that or is it better to maybe just wait out the winter a little bit? Well, first of all, I would just add to the question that if you have a broken tooth or you, uh, you, know, you have an abscess, don't stay home, go take care of it. Now, what dentists are doing very well today, I think, uh, because their practice is creating aerosols. So one, you have to sign up in the outdoors where you park, let them know you're there, Somebody comes out with a clipboard, you fill out the form. Yeah, you haven't been with anybody with COVID recently. You feel fine. You have your mask on, you come inside. No one's in the waiting room. You go right to your room. The room uh, and the dentist that I've seen recently has one of those plug-in machines with a HEPA filter and UV light. Every room has one of those, which I really uh, applaud the dentist for. The dentists and tech come in not only with an N95, but with a face shield or close goggles with the lenses outside where they wanna see some small thing. So I think it's relatively safe. Um, if you said, well, I'm 
you know, it's uh, six months or whatever. I might wait till uh, nine months. Uh, that's a pretty healthy response as well. Gotcha. So maybe if you if you if you check in with the dentist, <laughs> what kind of measures they've taken, and then if it's a cleaning, you know, maybe floss a little bit more and and and, and wait a little bit if you can. That's right. Our next question comes from our friend Kim. She says, "Any insights on blood type and susceptibility?" She read something about people with the O blood type might be less susceptible. Uh, or have less severe symptoms. Is there any truth to that? Should we all be just checking last time we gave blood? I think I'm A negative. Am I in the clear? No, it turns out to be true. Uh, I have A, uh, and we're more susceptible if you have blood group A. Oh, goody. But the difference clinically is very, very small. So um, even though if you look at a million people, you can get a P value to do anything statistically, but um, it's not clinically uh, going to be a big deal. So I'd stop worrying about it. Gotcha. So next question comes from our friend Suzanne, who I think is down in your neck of the woods. She's just over in Loymansburg, if I'm not mistaken. And she says, I am not, all caps, not a vaccine skeptic. And I've had my flu shot. Good for you, Suzanne. I have too. Um, but I am concerned about getting accurate information about the safety of vaccines when they become available. Where can we go to look for good information so we can make good judgments? You know, So we can say, I want the Johnson & Johnson, or I want the Moderna, or whatever it might be. Well, uh our first hope is that the companies will not tell us anything before we see the data. Uh, I don't want anybody to prejudice uh, my thinking. And they would do well uh, and gain more respect and more trust if they keep away until the independent body review, both at the FDA and maybe even somewhere else, do this. So first, we want the company to hold back. We want the FDA to assure us that they're not under any political pressure to approve a vaccine before it's uh, really been reviewed. I think the independent reviews have been, you know, generally over decades excellent uh, at the FDA. Uh, and I think they're under more pressure to make sure that people don't lose trust in the FDA. And I think the director feels that uh, very much personally these days because of some missteps earlier. So I would be looking at the uh, independent body uh, that critiques the FDA uh, industry presentation uh, when they do this uh, in the Washington area. Thereafter, you'd want to listen to people like Tony Fauci, for example, um, and experts around the country who said, look, I've reviewed the FDA panel and what they've said about this vaccine. And uh, here's my conclusion. So I think there are people out there who do well. There are some journals that you, know, you might imagine like Nature and Science and New England Journal that might comment on these as well. So I would look for those type of uh, perspectives, if you will, scientific. So is I it, think the things we can do. Is, there, is it your, your, your belief or your expectation that your colleagues at New England Journal of Medicine that you all will weigh in at some point when you have some data to look at? Yeah, I mean, if we had data, there's no question that uh, this is such an important thing. I can't imagine that there wouldn't be at least an editorial by, it wouldn't have to be anybody on the board, but by an expert who's really followed this. But to put it in perspective, here are the strengths of this study or the vaccine, here are the weaknesses here, or if we have two of them in the New England Journal, let's look at the strengths and weaknesses. Can we infer anything about the differences? Maybe, maybe not. So for many of us, we've started to suddenly go in, onto the internet and look at things like the Lancet and a lot of things that docs have been looking at for years. Uh, but obviously you have that mindset of it's got to be a clinical uh, trial and that ideally there's a certain process that we all go through to get those or that, that things go through to get approval. Anything to guard against, anything to sort of be worried about, misinformation, folks going ahead and trying to self-educate but maybe accidentally making a mistake. Places to avoid on the internet, I guess is the question. Well, um, you know, you really want to follow the science. Um, and if you are into conspiracy theories, you can certainly get into trouble. Um, you don't want to get some vaccine that maybe another country's had that really they haven't gone through the rigors that we have, uh, but you have a friend who can get you some. Uh, you know, those are unlikely things I would hope today. Um, if you stay with the science, stay with the expertise, um, we really need industry and the government to, to be apolitical and not be driven by profit. 
driven by doing the right thing. Next question comes from our friend Katie, and she asks, uh, Dr. Wenzel, your honest opinion or thoughts, is it safe to go to the gym with a mask on? Um, they have implemented distancing and they have some air filters. And realistically, when do you think we might be able to get to visit a gym and feel safe without a mask? Uh, or go to a conference or any other sort of large gathering, could see a concert, go to a Broadway, which we know is now closed until I think after Memorial Day, if I'm not mistaken. So um, the issues with gym, first of all, you're indoors. Remember the rate, 20 times greater than outdoors. The larger the gym, you might feel a little better with their changes. <clears throat> but remember, you know, I miss the gym and, and I've been trying to do my own thing at home. But so, but you're, these people are lifting big weights and you hear this grunting. Uh, and all I can imagine is a large number of droplets coming out of there, large and small, large ones going well beyond six feet, the small ones hanging around in the air for two to three hours. And so the person could actually leave who'd been weightlifting and grunting and groaning. Uh, and I come in an hour later and I could still inhale them. So I don't recommend going to the gym. Uh, um, be blunt about that. Uh, doesn't, not everybody in the family agrees with me, um, but I just think it's an indoor, it's a droplet. Um, they aren't, you know, if the gym started putting UV light in, I'd feel better. HEPA filters, I'd feel better. If they could leave the windows open, I'd feel better. If they could set all the stuff outdoors, that'd be a different story. But again, a gym is one of those indoor gatherings of people, even though they're six feet apart and there's no magic about six feet and you can't control the aerosols that are there for hours. Yeah, I think mean, one of the things we've discovered as a family is that there's a bunch of gyms out there just in nature. We were fortunate where we live, there's lots of hills. And so suddenly that Stairmaster has become running up and down the hill a dozen times, which is not a lot of fun. And it's an ugly picture yeah. <laughs> by my fifth trip up the hill, but it certainly does get a sweat up. Um, next question comes from our, uh, our friend Phil, and he's asking, I think this is just a math question as much as anything. He says, with a population in the United States that's less than 400 million people, how is it that if we have 400 million doses of the, of the vaccine, potentially, or that we would need 400 million doses of vaccine to cover uh, the population? Well, what I was trying to point out is most of the vaccine, not all of them, require two doses. That's the way they've been studied. So generally the first dose and then three or four weeks later, the second dose. And you have to remember which one you got, of course, because you can't mix and match. Um, and so if we have roughly 300 million people, a little bit more, 330, and I use 300 just to make the math easy, we would need uh, you know, um, 600 million doses to get the entire population. But for herd immunity, we need enough for 200 million people or 400 million doses. Um, if the J, J vaccine requires only one dose, that'll change the math a little bit and make it a little bit easier that we don't have to have those high numbers. Um, but I was mostly just looking at the probability of more likely two vaccine doses, but we'll see. And, and given what you said, that some of these vaccines are awfully hard to transport, do you think it's going to be a real challenge getting distribution out there? <clears throat> For instance, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I got a, a flu vaccine at the CVS, just walked in and the pharmacist grabbed a vial and gave me a dose. Easy peasy. Is it going to look like that for our vaccine or, or is it going to be a little bit different, do you think? Hopefully, uh, I mean, there should be a system set up now where a lot of the vaccine is distributed by CDC to the state health departments and then maybe to certain physician offices and even to some of the large uh, uh, drug stores, for example, like Walmart or Walgreens. Um, so hopefully that's laid out. Along the way, there has to be a cold chain of carrying and storage of these things. So when it's being moved uh, in trucks or airplanes and when it's being stored uh, in wherever it goes in the state or in the county, that has to be cold or maybe frozen for some of the vaccines if the gene vaccines get through. So all of that. Now, if you want to think globally, <clears throat> you would not probably think, well, if we're going to talk about vaccinating people in the middle of India or the middle of the Congo, that we want a vaccine that has to be frozen. So we would probably modify the approach 
uh, globally, depending on the ability of each of the continents, if you will, or, or the countries within each of the continents to be able to keep the vaccine stable through coldness or through delivery time, not getting wet, so forth. Uh, last question is going to go to Betsy, and her question is, and maybe this has an application for next week as well, how would you handle Thanksgiving and some of the other big holiday events that are coming up our way? And maybe that could even include going out to vote on election day next Tuesday. Um, what's your best recommendation? What should we do about Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, and, and even just going out to vote in person? Next it's week? really tough because uh, we miss uh, not only seeing the people in many cases, but hugging them, even if you've seen them. And a lot of us, you know, just haven't hugged our children or parents uh, for quite some time, our sibs. <clears throat> but again, uh, I would, I'm on, going to err on the side of caution, I think, and maybe my conservative view that we really should try to th think this through. Uh, I can imagine a, vac a Thanksgiving or, if you will, where you're outdoors and you can handle it because it's warm enough or because you created warmth. Uh, no sides. People walk two blocks because that's when these close friends or the relatives live. And you're just going to have your meal, wave to each other six feet apart, mask on when you're not uh, eating and drinking, and then you're going to go home. The alternative is your relatives are flying in for a three-night stay at your house. They have two uh, airline trips. Uh, a couple people coming into the house are diabetic or obese or have heart disease. Uh, one of them is on immune suppressors for rheumatoid arthritis. And we're going to be indoors for three days. That's the other extreme. That one's easy, you know, and the first one's easy. But it's the in-between that we wrestle with. And I would tell people, if you can make it very simple and safe and distance and mass, you might be able to do that, but I wouldn't be, um, I, I would try to be more cautious this year through the holidays. We may not be able to do the Thanksgiving, and I know I won't be able to, that we uh, tend to enjoy for many, many years or decades even. Uh, and I wish it were not so, but I think we have to face the reality. This is an unforgiving virus. And so we will leave it there. Uh, Katie is asking for your contact information. So maybe just before we jump, Tristan, can we jump back to the first slide where Dr. Wenzel's email and all the rest of it is there? And while we're doing that, sir, let me just say thank you. Uh, obviously not the, 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 you know, we don't have wonderful news to share with everybody, but it is important to stay educated and, and news is uh, evolving every single day. And so we are incredibly grateful to you. Uh, and Maria is saying that with all caps and lots of exclamation points. So what she said, thank you, thank you very much. Hopefully we can ask you maybe come back. Um, last question while we're, we're putting this up just so folks can see it and then I know we do have to jump. Um, uh, the Vice President, Vice President Biden in a recent uh, political debate said that he expected to see about, we had a little over 200,000 and that's far too many deaths. And one is too many here in the United States but we're at 220 or so now. He expected us to be at about 400,000 come the end of the year. Do you still see that? I remember you saying something like that. Do you still see that us on that kind of trajectory where we might have another 200,000 deaths or thereabouts between now and, and, and December 31? Well, I think we'll have probably more than uh, 300,000. And I've been thinking more around 350. Um, it's uh, that, you know, it could get worse. Uh, and particularly because uh, day by day it's getting cooler and we're seeing more indoor activity. So it's in the ballpark of where we could see between 300 and 400,000. And a lot depends on what individuals and communities do to try to you know, use the simple measures we know work, even though they're so difficult to both enforce and to um, carry out, if you will, because we've been, we're getting exhausted from uh, this COVID. Everybody is getting restless. But again, I keep saying, don't drop your guard. We have to hang in there for uh, uh, another several months till we get into late spring, early summer. So any, any advice for how to do that? Is, is Any suggestions from, from your, your long experience? How can we all manage the stress? Well, that's going to not be easy. But I think one of the things that uh, we can do is maintain our true contact with people. 
and I'm not saying um, uh, social media, I'm talking about getting on the phone or talking to walking with people, you know, apart. Uh, if you can set it up, I mean, my wife has a group of two other friends, the three of them walking uh, parallel to each other every day, a couple miles, and they talk. I think that's a good thing to do. <clears throat> if you live in an area where you can be outdoors uh, and you can be 10 feet away from somebody and they bring their own lemonade and you have yours, uh, that can be a very enjoyable time. Um, and maybe they'd even bring a, a, a luncheon, you know, and you have yours. Again, you're respecting the basics, six feet mask on when we're not outdoors as much as possible. Um, and then I think writing letters. Uh, I thought about that more even before COVID. It was rare to get a real letter from somebody, but now it would have such value. Uh, it'd be good. Uh, and then I think people have to rediscover with a newer passion reading, because then you get carried away from this place where you are and you're in this imaginary world where there isn't COVID. They got other things, but it isn't COVID. And it takes you away. Um, uh, obviously, there are people who like to uh, meditate. And in sense, uh, running or jogging or just walking sometimes can be meditated. Don't put the earphones on. Listen to the real nature. I think, you know, I never understood people running on beaches and covering up their ears. It just never made sense to me. When you could hear okay. waves, we could hear birds. So re-listen to those. And we will leave it there, sir. Hopefully you'll be able to come back and join us in, a, in another couple of weeks and we can hopefully have some better news to share, maybe even a vaccine in the next couple of months. Uh, but for now, let's leave it there. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving and happy Halloween. I know we're all doing it from a distance, but, uh, but grateful and hoping that you and, and your family are safe and well. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, thanks, Tristan, who's behind the scenes, I know. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you all very, very soon. Be well.